Thank you. Let's see if I can figure out the technology here. That should hopefully look about right. Um, I'm going to talk about studies of food and mouth disease virus pathogenesis. Um, that we've been doing through the past 10 years or so at the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. Um, but to start out, since I'm the first one to present here, um, I'm going to start with just a little bit of context and an introduction to Plum Island. Um, as most might know, Plum Island houses a research facility with high containment laboratories. Um, in current days, there are three different US government agencies on the island. Um, these are the Science and Technology Directorate of Department of Homeland Security, as well as two US Department of Agriculture agencies, namely the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS, and the Agricultural Research Service, or ARS, of which I'm a part. Um, these three agencies have slightly different missions, uh, but we're all brought together based on the infectious diseases that we work with, which are all classified as foreign animal diseases. Um, for a long time, Plum Island has been the only facility in the US where it's been possible to work with these agents. And it is still today the only facility in the US where we are able to work with foot and mouth disease virus. Now, the unit between within the Agricultural Research Service that is based on Plum Island is known as the Foreign Animal Disease Research Unit or FADRU. Um, and I'm happy to have been part of this unit for the past nine years now. Um, FADRU operates under a mission that mostly consists of providing critical scientific knowledge um, and developing tools to support control of infectious animal diseases of livestock. Um, there's quite some legacy to this research unit. Um, most of won't actually be discussed more in this seminar series, but um, because of that, I wanted to mention just a few key deliverables that have come out of the unit in the past years. Um, most well known of these are probably the ad 5 FMD vaccine um, that was initially developed by Marvin Grubman's group and subsequently transferred to DHS for testing and development. Um, in addition to that, Elizabeth Reader's lab has also developed a novel leaderless FMD vaccine platform that has recently received a select agent exclusion, which means it can now be manufactured in the, on the US mainland. Um, and finally, more recently, um, extensive studies into the genetic basis of African swine fever virulence that has been led by Manuel Borker and Doug Gladue has led to design of four live attenuated vaccine candidates um, that have been patented and are now uh, being licensed to commercial partners for further testing and development. And that could potentially be a real game changer for that disease. Um, but um, now I'm going to transition straight into the main topic of this presentation, which is food and mouth disease or FMD. Um, this is a viral infection that affects cloven hoofed animal species. Um, it's a highly contagious disease. It's caused by foot and mouth disease virus, not so surprising maybe, um, which is a Picorna virus and that within the US is classified as a tier one select agent. Um, foot and mouth disease is mostly known by its clinical characteristics, um, which are fever and vesicular lesions on the feet and mouth. Again, not so surprising. Um, these lesions do lead to varying degrees of lameness and reduced feed take in animals. Um, mortality in adult animals is generally quite low, but can be considerably higher in juveniles. Um, it is possible to vaccinate against FMD, uh, but it's complicated as there are seven different serotypes of the virus and numerous subtypes uh, within each of the serotypes. Um, in the group that I am based in, which is run by Dr. Jonathan Arzt, um, we do various types of investigations that are related to FMD pathogenesis. Um, in broad strokes, these can mostly be um, divided into laboratory experimental studies or field studies. Um, and within the lab, um, we can sort of simplify the objective of most of what we do with trying to figure out what happens when and where when an animal becomes infected with food and mouth disease virus with possible additions of why and how. Um, and we've used the term temporal anatomic disease progression as a more sciencey descriptor, descriptor of this approach. Um, and so in addition to this, we also do some more applied studies uh, that focus on providing specific estimates of FMD infection phases and transmission parameters that can subsequently be used for epidemiological modeling of FMD outbreaks. And I will give some examples of output 
of both of these types of experiments. Um, I will not be talking more about field work today, uh, but this is an important component of what we do. Um, and importantly, um, the findings from our laboratory studies um, inform the design of field studies and vice versa. Um, and both approaches have their advantages and limitations, uh, but the ability of combining knowledge gained from both entities is very valuable. Um, in relation to laboratory experiments, um, we have realized that study design and specifically the challenge system by which animals are infected with a virus uh, have a massive impact on specific pathogenesis events. Um, food and disease virus has been studied experimentally through multiple decades um, and certain experimental approaches have more or less just been passed on through generations of scientists sometimes without much further thought of what they are actually doing. Um, this specifically applies to infection of animals with foot and disease virus through needle inoculation, uh, which is by far the most common approach of studying FMD. Um, this is a highly consistent system that's very controllable and performs well, i.e. animals consistently become sick. Um, but if you want to study FMD pathogenesis, so disease mechanisms or host response, um, this approach is problematic because you are basically bypassing uh, the natural routes of virus entry, which involve the mucosal surfaces of the um, upper respiratory tract or upper gastrointestinal tract, depending on the host species. Um, so with development of what we refer to as simulated natural inoculation systems, uh, we've developed standardized systems to infect animals with FMDB Allowing, that allow us to maintain control of the dose of the virus challenge as well as the timing of infection while still allowing a more natural route of virus entry um, and engaging these mucosal surfaces. The first milestone of this work was completed before I joined the group by Jonathan Arst and colleagues. Um, it consisted of optimization of an aerosol inoculation system for cattle, so you can see in that middle picture, um, this basically involves fitting this aerosol delivery mask onto the animals and letting them breathe in the virus over a certain amount of time. Um, this approach was quite successful and has been used a lot, but it's not quite suitable for large scale investigations. Uh, what it did, however, was to allow determination of the primary site of FMDV infection in cattle, which is within the nasopharynx or the upper respiratory tract. And this led to development of a second generation model, which is the picture at the bottom, uh, which is what we refer to as intranasopharyngeal or INP inoculation. Uh, this is a much simpler approach. It basically involves deposition of virus inoculum into the upper respiratory tract uh, using a flexible plastic catheter. Um, We've used this IMP inoculation system for a considerable amount of studies. Um, this image is derived from a review article that was published just last year, uh, but it's pretty much a summary of about 10 years of work and multiple experiments. And it's supposed to illustrate this temporal anatomic progression of hematosis virus in cattle through different phases of infection. Um, so if we start with non-vaccinated animals at the top of the image, um, the initial site of infection is located within epithelial cells in the nasopharyngeal mucosa in the upper respiratory tract. Um, from there, there's this systemic generalization of disease that's characterized by high tides of viremia, and that coincides pretty much with the development of fever and these characteristic vesicular lesions, the feet and on the mouth. Um, but very importantly, after clearance of the systemic phase of infection, cattle go through what we refer to as a transitional phase of infection, um, during which they either clear virus completely or progress into the persistent phase of infection, which is also known as the FNDV carrier state, during which replicating virus is again restricted to the upper respiratory tract. Now, vaccinated cattle or otherwise protected animals, they do go through similar phases. Um, so while this primed immune response prevents systemic generalization and clinical disease, most of these animals do actually still get infected and they maintain this infection in the upper respiratory tract through varying durations, including this FMDV carrier state. This is, an, this is an immunomicroscopy image of a frozen section from the nasopharyngeal mucosa of a state that was vaccinated and challenged and then euthanized 24 hours after the virus exposure. 
Um, the green color in the image is cytokeratin, which is a marker of epithelial cells, so that's your mucosal surface. Um, the red color is the FNDV capsid protein, um, and then you have blue and purple as CD11C and MHC2 as markers of presumptive antigen presenting cells. If we look at this at a closer view, this is the same slide, um, we see how the virus is localized to these green epithelial cells, um, while there's also this marked influx of these host immune cells to the infected area. Um, and this local reaction we're seeing here is quite typical for vaccinated animals. It's not quite this apparent in naive animals, at least not until a little bit later on in the infection. Um, this next slide is a similarly prepared tissue section, uh, but this time the sample is harvested at 35 days post-infection. Um, so this is persistent FNDV infection in the nasopharynx. Um, here again, you have epithelium in green and the FNDV capsid antibody in red. Uh, but in this image, you also have a non-structural protein in this light blue color that you almost can't see because it's right on top of the red color. Um, it's there. Um, this is an anti-FNDV polymerase antibody, um, which suggests that there's actually a somewhat active virus replication going on in this tissue this late on in infection. Um, interesting here also is that despite this ongoing infection, there's no evidence of inflammation or activation of the host immune response in association with these foci of persistent infection in cattle. Um, from that, I'm going to transition to talk about pigs instead. Um, we, these are not little cows. Uh, they're quite their own entity, and definitely so in relation to FNV pathogenesis. Um, conventional wisdom has stated that it's, pigs are fairly resistant to FNV infection by airborne routes. Uh, are more likely to get infected through oral uptake of the virus. Um, we did do some preliminary study in which we compared the outcome of nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal deposition of virus, and we found that it was impressively difficult to make a pig sick with FMD by depositing high tide of virus inoculum into its upper respiratory tract, uh, whereas intraoropharyngeal deposition of the same virus inoculum was far more consistent, and that ended up being the approach that we've used for the majority of our experiments. Um, so if we look at the timeline of FMD in pigs, primary infection occurs in the oropharyngeal tonsils, that's different from cattle, uh, oropharynx is the upper gastrointestinal tract. Um, there's then, similar to cattle, this phase of systemic generalization of infection that coincides with the appearance of the clinical disease. And then the thing that's very special about pigs um, is that they're highly efficient in complete clearance of the virus. There's no persistent phase of FNDV infection in pigs. Um, this section is a paraepiglottic tonsil from a naive pig, again harvested at 24 hours after infection. The green color is again an epithelial marker. So the structure in the middle of the image is an epithelial crypt within a tonsil. The red color, again, is the FNDV infected epithelial cells. If we look at the close up, we can see that also in pigs, this is a strictly epithelial infection, but it also attracts some variety of the host cells in the surrounding tissue. Um, so I mentioned there's no persistent phase of FNDV infection in pigs. Um, despite the lack of detection of infectious virus from about two to three weeks out, um, it is still possible to detect FNDV genome and capsid protein in lymphoid follicles or lymph nodes, basically, of pigs that have recovered from clinical FMD. Um, this image shows a popliteal lymph node. Again, the FNDV capsid protein is in red, um, and this time it's in the, in the middle of a lymphoid follicle in a lymph node. Um, but very important here that this does not represent presence of infectious virus. And if you give it a little bit more time, um, these remnants of infections will also get cleared. Um, so with that, I'm again briefly going to transition to talk about some more practical studies of FMDB transmission that we have done. Um, this first slide is just a generic illustration of the progression of basically any infectious disease uh, with a timeline on the x-axis. Um, so to start at the bottom, the time that passes from infection to the first appearance of clinical signs is what we generally refer to as the incubation phase. Um, but there's also this less apparent transition uh, that consists of the transition from the latent or non-infectious period to the infectious period during which disease can actually be transmitted. 
Um, this is something that we've heard a lot about recently, specifically in relation to SARS-CoV-2. Um, but before then, uh, there's been quite some inconsistencies regarding the relevance of incubation phase transmission, specifically as it relates to food and mouth disease. And this is something that's highly important if you want to use epidemiological models um, to estimate the impact of potential FMD outbreaks. Um, so we wanted to investigate this further um, and to determine whether or not transmission occurred during the, the incubation phase. Um, we designed an experiment in which seven different groups of contact pigs were sequentially exposed to the same group of FMDB infected donor pigs. Um, so these contact groups were moved in and out of one room that housed inf FMDB infected pigs. Uh, they each group spent eight hours with these donor pigs, and then they were moved along to their own isolation rooms after that. Um, what happened there was that the first two groups of contact pigs that were exposed to these donors, first from eight to 16 hours, and then again from 16 to 24 hours after infection of the donor pigs, did not get infected despite detection of FMDV in um, oral secretions from these infected donor pigs. Um, however, all subsequent contact groups were infected, which gives us this nice transition from latent to infectious phase and the onset of infectiousness at approximately 24 hours after infection of these donor pigs. Um, however, relevant to this, the purpose of the experiment, we didn't detect any clinical signs of FMD in these donor pigs, no fever, lesions, or lameness, or anything that would suggest that they were sick until 48 hours after infection. Um, so these pigs were actually capable of transmitting the infection during the incubation phase for approximately 24 hours before they themselves showed any signs of disease. Um, so that gives us this defined period of preclinical or um, incubation phase transmission. Um, so based on those findings, we went on to do another study to determine the duration of infectiousness or the, the end of the infectious period. Um, this is a similar timeline, this time it's days instead of hours, so slightly less intensive. Um, the outcome of that experiment was that these contact exposed pigs that were exposed at five days or 10 days post infection of the donor pigs did get sick, uh, but there was no transmission occurring as late as 15 days out. Um, so if we summarize these two studies, we get this nice timeline of FMDB infection in pigs. Um, we determined the onset of infectiousness to approximately one day after infection. Clinical signs of FMD appeared approximately one day later at day two. Um, these lesions start to heal up at about seven to 10 days. Uh, we had transmission at 10 days, but not at 15. So that determines that range determines the end of infectiousness. And that gives us this duration of infectiousness of approximately 10 days or more. And this is substantially longer than has previously been reported for cattle. Um, and again, this is something that really makes a difference if you want to use mathematical models to predict the impact of potential FMD outbreaks, specifically if pigs are involved. Um, so that's an example of more of a practical experiment answering a specific question. Um, so in closing, I want to just again briefly touch upon the legacy of research that's been done at Plum Island, um, which is least in regard to the Foreign Animal Disease Research Unit, consists of this approach of providing basic science to address real world problems, also with a focus of this translational research that can then be further developed in collaboration with external stakeholders. And although we'll be finding ourselves in brand new surroundings uh, with this impending move to MBAF, uh, we very much hope that this legacy will live on by continuing to build upon what we have accomplished through our time at Plum Island. Um, and last but definitely not least, I want to give a shout out to our research group, which is run by Jonathan Arzt and involves a somewhat dynamic group of people without, without which none of this could have been possible. So thank you very much. This is um, pre and post pandemic lab gatherings. Thank you. Well, very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Carolina, for, uh, for putting that together. Um, I guess I have one quick question here. I, I'll ask it while other folks are composing uh, questions in the in the Q and A box. Um, I, it, when your first your slides, we showed some of the pathogenicity in in um, in lung and cattle. Um, do you have any idea how the cattle sort of control inflammation? You mentioned that there there wasn't any. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? I didn't. 
hear the question. Do you have any idea how the cattle control inflammation? I think it was in the lung uh, in the, your cattle model. Um, I don't really have a very good answer answer for that. I think you need an immunologist, and um, we we have looked mostly at, at gene expression in at the primary site, which is in the upper respiratory tract. Um, and we, we know that FMDV is capable of in, inhibiting the interferon response, but we still, despite that, we do see a, a systemic spike of interferon associated with pyrimia. So there's, there's some aspects there that we don't really know how they fit together. Um, right. Okay, great. Um, so I'll go to the, uh, the chat box here. Um, just been looking at a couple of questions to ask. Um, well, I guess he already touched on this already. Is like any idea how FMDV blocks the uh, host innate uh, immune response? And if so, what mechanisms? Um, it, it does definitely block yeah. interferon, in, it, but it depends on how you look at it. Because like I said, we do see a systemic spike of interferon that coincides with the varemia. So depending on which model system you use, you can, but you can definitely in vitro, it does block interferon, uh, mm -hmm. but there's in the animal, there seems to be some bypassing of that. It, FMDV basically blocks transcription of anything. Um, it, it blocks cap dependent um, RNA translation. Right, like other picornaviruses. Yes. <laughs> um, I guess uh, one of the uh, questions is uh, sort of the difference between cattle and, and pigs. Um, you know, one uh, is capable of setting up persistent infection, the other one not. Yeah, that's 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 what I would really like to figure out. <laughs> that was my my like when I grow up. That's what I want to want to figure out. Um, I don't know. Uh, there are differences. We have looked specifically within cattle. There seems to be a Th1 Th2 bias. So this very strong viremia seems to stimulate a very strong antibody-mediated response, which is efficient in clearing the viremia. It's not very efficient in clearing intracellular virus. Um, whereas we see in the in the cattle that that clear infection, they have a little bit of stronger suggestion of a stronger cellular response, which which makes sense. Uh, but so far, that those are quite preliminary findings. And what I would love to do is look at the pigs and see what they're doing because they're clearly getting it right. Um, it is a little bit hard to. It, it seems easy, but it's actually quite hard to com directly compare the host response in two different species because uh, the the genes are different. Great. Um, so my, oh, there you go. My, my camera locked up there. So we're going to say, um, I guess I have another question uh, in here about the, uh, the multi, multi spectral imaging. Uh, how do you, how do you do that? Any, any use of GFP? Or, this is uh, old school microscopy. I don't, we don't even, I don't even have a confocal microscope. Uh, we use multi-channel uh, immunofluorescence. Um, I'm not against confocal microscopy. I've just never had the uh, possibility of using it. That might be what I, if I, if I'm lucky enough to go to MBAF, I might, um, progress to that, but basically we have five different channels. We have antibodies that we detect with different secondary fluorescent, um, and commercial, commercially available secondary fluorescent antibodies, and we shoot different channels and put it together. Right. Um, I see another question in here. Uh, is uh, FMD uh, preclinical infectious period, is it similar across species? Um, it's a good question. We have specifically studied these in pigs. There are other publications from cattle uh, suggesting that it might not be the same in cattle. They did use a slightly different approach to their study specifically. This, this seems also to be a difference if you house animals in groups or one-on-one -on -one because just the way that they interact with each other. Um, it hasn't been studied to the same degree in cattle. Leave mm -hmm. that as an answer. Um, so short version, version is we don't really know. Right. Uh, there's a question in here um, about persistence in, in non-primary sites like neurons. Um, is, is does FMDV do anything like this? I mean, I guess there's some precedence with other corners when Poli obviously has a neuron. <clears throat> there, yeah, the, there isn't much known about this. We don't have any evidence that that would happen. There are some, you know, anecdotal evidence of some potential CNS um, effects in persistently infected animals, specifically heat intolerance. Uh, but whether or not that has to do with the virus actually being present there or not, I, I don't think anyone has proven that. So as far as we know now, that's, that's, we don't have any evidence of that. Right. Okay. 
Um, I guess one question that came to my mind was in your experimental studies, have you tried different age cohorts? Do you have a different sort of uh, progression uh, depending on if you use younger animals or older animals? It's a really good question. And it's something we don't really do that much experimentally, mostly because it's difficult to house very large animals in containment. Uh, we tend to, at least with our groups, we get animals that are like slightly above juvenile. Our cows are usually about a year old, but that is mostly because we have this um, thing with FNDV that juvenile animals can have a slightly different progression. Specifically, they get myocarditis and that's something that we don't really want unless we're specifically trying to study it. Um, but there, there is you know, anecdotal evidence, again, that there, there might be variation. Specifically, there's also a lot of variation if we look at the, the breeds that we use uh, in our intensive production system compared to breeds that are local to endemic regions, they can have a much milder disease. So um, unfortunately, when we try to standardize experiments, we, we try to get animals that are as similar as possible. So. Um, but it's something that would make sense to look at for someone. Right. Um, I guess it looks like we got time. Well, one last question here. Um, any thoughts about uh, strain or serotype differences in the infection timelines, you know, particularly whether uh, any serotype lineage differences are more evident or apparent between cattle and, and pigs? As yeah, there the, the definitely are differences. It's very hard to say something like one serotype is worse than the other, because what we see is that there's more variation between strains. So two strains of different serotypes can be very similar, whereas two strains within the same serotype can be highly different. Mm -hmm. Specifically within the serotype O, we know that there are some differences in host range amongst different strains. So there's this conventional thing that it's like seven different diseases because it's seven different serotypes. And I usually counter that and, and say that it's more like it's a different disease depending on which host species you look at. Um, so there, there, are, there are differences between the strains and serotypes, but it, it's hard to say anything like uh, consistent, uh, but the host species definitely has, has a greater impact on, on the kind of disease that you see. Right. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Caroline. And uh, I think we will move on to uh, the next speaker. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Amy Hartman. Uh, and she comes to us from the uh, University of uh, Pittsburgh, uh, the Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health. And uh, she's going to be talking to us about recent insights.